live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. For the last half decade, I thought the worst thing about 28-3 and what happened at Super Bowl 51 was the fact that it gave the New England Patriots yet another ring. It gave the most hated team in football yet another chance to show off why they were better than everyone else. However, I was wrong. Because now, that has changed. Because the worst thing about 28-3 is the fact that it allowed this movie to be made. You know they're not making this movie if it wasn't for that. You know they're not making it about Super Bowl 53, one of the most boring Super Bowls ever played. But nope. Because of the Falcons and their choke job, we got this movie, which is every bit as bad as you might have thought it was. The movie's about Super Bowl 51, but in reality, it plays like Super Bowl 29. Prior to that game, the San Francisco 49ers were gigantic favorites, even more so than the Baltimore Colts were at Super Bowl 3. No one thought that game would be good. Everyone expected an unwatchable mess. And sure enough, the game was an unwatchable mess. And this movie plays out the same way. You go in with no hopes. You expect something unwatchable. And for the most part, that's exactly what you get. 80 for Brady is based on a true story. And I use the term based on a true story insanely loosely here. Because it's grounded in reality as much as if I made a movie about singing unicorns. And centers around four ladies. Lou, Trish, Mora, and Betty. Played by Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda... Rita Moreno, and Sally Field. After the Patriots advance to Super Bowl 51, they have the idea to go to the game, knowing that it might be the last chance they get, and knowing that this might be Tom Brady's last Super Bowl ever. From there, a whole bunch of shenanigans ensue, and the ladies have an unforgettable weekend. And I decided to see this movie. I do this for you guys. I went in with an open mind. Heck, I thought the NFL's game on Nickelodeon was going to be a train wreck and it turned out to be an incredible broadcast. But this? Yeah, not so much. So I want to break this review down into two parts. The second part is going to be my thoughts on the movie, what I thought about it, and some of the many flaws about it. However, before I do that, because I know this was a pressing question on everyone's mind, as a football historian, I have to answer the obvious question, which is... How historically accurate is this movie? Granted, I know that the target audience for this is not diehard football fans. In fact, I'm probably about the furthest possible thing from the target audience, seeing as when I went, I was the only guy in the theater that was alone, and I was in a theater that was about 85% full, and in that theater, I was one of three people who don't qualify for social security. But for those who wanted to watch this movie from a football perspective, what are they getting out of it? You know how in Saving Private Ryan, people watch that movie because of its super realistic portrayal of World War II, and because the opening 20 minutes are the most historically accurate portrayal of the war you're going to see? Yeah, no one's watching 80 for Brady because of that, I can tell you that much. Because you know it's going to be bad when the very first scene, and quite literally, the very first shot of the movie, shows fans tailgating for the AFC Championship and shows the four ladies watching the game in broad daylight. That's right. You know how the Patriots defeated the Steelers in this game, which was wet and kicked off at 6.40 p.m. and ended sometime around 10 o'clock? Not according to this movie, where it kicked off sometime around 11 o'clock in the morning. The four ladies are based in Boston, are watching the game in Boston, and yet, even though they show actual shots of the game during the scene, so it's nighttime, the windows of their home show that it's sunny, meaning that we're in some alternate dimension where it's both daytime and nighttime in Boston at the same exact time. The sun would have set a solid seven hours before the end of this scene happened, but apparently, in this spot in Boston, it's treated like parts of Alaska during the summertime, where the sun never sets. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. There's a part where they're all at the NFL experience at the Super Bowl, and there's a giant display of all of the helmets from all 32 teams. And shocker, a lot of them are wrong, and they use the current version of the helmet, 
instead of the version that existed during the 2016 season. Washington's helmet is wrong. The left is the helmet that it should have been, and the right is the helmet that they used. Jacksonville's helmet, because of course I recognize that, is also wrong. The left is the helmet that it should have been, with the two-tone, run-out-of-paint-midway-through style, and the right is the helmet that they used. And perhaps most egregious, the Rams' helmet is wrong. The left is the helmet that it should have been, and the right is the helmet that they used. Not even the same color. No attention whatsoever to the finer details. However, I will say this. If you have a limited knowledge of football, or have no knowledge of football, none of these things will make a difference to you. And Super Bowl 51 is pretty accurate. There's a point in the game where the clock is stopped, and during the TV timeout, the ladies get on the Jumbotron, and when it happens, it's a nothing-nothing game with 5.08 left in the first quarter. The TV timeout stoppage at that time and the score are accurate. The game plays out exactly the same. It doesn't end with Tom Brady miraculously scoring a 99-yard touchdown. So in terms of the historical accuracy, it's bad, don't get me wrong, but it could be a heck of a lot worse. And that leads us to the actual review of the movie. How was the film itself? Note that for this section, I am going to be talking spoilers. So if you do not wish to have this film spoiled for you for some reason, and I'm not sure why, seeing as you know everything that happens, I turn the video off now, and I promise you, we're back to football-related content tomorrow. I apologize in advance. But there's truly nothing about this movie that needs to not be spoiled. They show the final scene of the movie in the trailer, so you know they get into the game and into the locker room afterwards. And being angry at me for saying that the Patriots come back to beat the Falcons in the Super Bowl is like being angry at me for spoiling Titanic by saying that the boat sinks. And beneath all the silliness of this movie, the main flaw is, quite simply, that it's just not a well-made movie by any means. There are so many flaws with this movie that I don't even know where to begin. Besides the central conflict of the ladies trying to get into the Super Bowl and see Tom Brady, every lady has a side conflict that they're dealing with in their personal lives, which helps us to get to know them better. However, with the exception of Lou's conflict, where something might have come up with the test results and she might be dying, None of these conflicts are even the slightest bit memorable, or they get resolved faster than Chris Johnson can run the 40-yard dash. There's one conflict involving Betty, where she's trying to deal with her husband bugging her about writing an essay and wanting her to look his work over, and she says, no, I'm not doing that. Think for yourself. And her husband's like, you're right. I love you. All right, so that was pointless. That subplot went absolutely nowhere. The subplots are just there to pad time, which is crazy, seeing as this movie clocks in at just 98 minutes including the credits. But trust me, you feel all 98 of those minutes, especially in the second act, which we'll get to in a bit. There are also some very basic continuity things that should not have happened. This movie is not very well made in that regard, and felt extremely rushed, almost like they were on a tight deadline and had to get it out before the Super Bowl. There's a scene at a Wings competition where there's a person behind the ladies throughout the entire competition wearing a Chargers jersey. And yet, when they cut to an aerial shot of the competition at times, there's not a Chargers jersey anywhere to be found. There's a scene where they're watching the Super Bowl and the Patriots are driving in the red zone. Then, it shows the TV in the skybox where they're watching the game. And the Patriots are on their own 30-yard line. And there's the thing I mentioned earlier where the AFC Championship is taking place at daytime and nighttime simultaneously. Just basic things like that, where any halfway competent script supervisor would have noticed it. But they didn't. But even if we're not talking about continuity, this movie just drags. The movie is called 80 for Brady, but the real star of the movie, at least in terms of how much screen time he gets, is Guy Fieri. I have no idea why he's in this movie and I have no idea why he is in for roughly one-eighth of a movie, but it is absolutely baffling, because he serves no purpose whatsoever. It's a solid ten minutes of the movie featuring Guy Fieri just being Guy Fieri and doing nothing to advance the plot. You could have put me in the movie, or you could have eliminated him entirely, 
and the movie would have been exactly the same. They're at a wings competition hosted by Guy that serves no purpose. The ladies talk to Guy afterwards, which serves no purpose. They talk to him again in a porta potty, which serves no purpose. At a house party, everyone turns into Guy Fieri, which serves no purpose. Nothing about Guy Fieri's cameo in this movie, which isn't even a cameo seeing how many scenes he's in, makes any sense. And every scene when the ladies are in Houston leading up to the game just drags and goes on forever. There's a scene where all the ladies are at a house party, and it's complete and utter filler. The only reason it's there is so that it gives the ladies an excuse to run into certain people. Let's talk about the acting of the Patriots really quickly before I go into my number one problem with the movie. Yeah, no one can act. I know that seems shocking, but Tom Brady is completely wooden throughout the entire movie. During the scenes where he's talking to the ladies in their imagination and appears through a TV screen or a talking bobblehead, it's almost as though he's reading his lines off a teleprompter. Rob Gronkowski. Oh, but I'm special. Yeah, you know exactly what you're getting. But what's odd is that the promos made it seem like Ron played a pivotal part in this movie. And in reality, he does not. He's on screen more often in the USAA commercial than he is in this movie. He's in this movie for the final scene in the locker room, where he says three lines, one of which is hey, and that's it. If you're going into this movie expecting to see Gronk, you're going to be sorely disappointed, I'll put it that way, because he is barely in this movie. Danny Amendola is in the movie for longer than Rob Gronkowski is. But of the many problems with this movie, from its poor competence, to its filler and padded second act, to the fact that it's not funny, with all the chuckles I got coming in the first act, and with the only humor in the movie coming in the form of sexual jokes that get old after about five minutes once you know what's coming, was the fact that everything about it lacked common sense. And this lacking of common sense was used as a way to drive the plot forward because the writers couldn't think of any other ideas. One of the big conflicts is that when they're in Houston, they lose the tickets to the game. But the way that they lose them is so stupid. They're in the hotel on Saturday before the game. Lou asks the ladies which one of them wants to hold on to the tickets. Betty says she'll do it. And then, she misplaces them at the NFL experience. Now you might notice a major frustrating problem with that. Why is she carrying around the tickets in the first place? The game's not until Sunday. Why are you carrying the tickets on you in person to a public place on a Saturday? Just leave them in the hotel room. Who does that? Who carries around five, maybe even six figures worth of tickets on them to an event where they don't need the tickets? Ask yourself this. If you're a student and you have to turn in your homework on Friday and it's Thursday and you go back home from school and while you're home, a friend asks you if you want to go to a house party at his place, and you say yes. Are you carrying that homework sheet on you to the party? Of course you're not! You don't need it then! And yet, one of the main conflicts in the movie centers around the premise and the idea that someone is dumb enough to do that. It's never acknowledged, as in Betty saying, Don't worry guys, I got this, and the other three people saying, Just leave the tickets in the room. No, this is just a thing that happens. Just so stupid. And then, there's the whole thing about what happens when they get into the game. I promise you, everything that I'm saying here is 100% true, as absurd as it's going to sound. So you have to take my word for it. Otherwise, you can try and disprove me and pay the 10 bucks and waste two hours of your life seeing this thing. Security at the Super Bowl, to no surprise, is shown to be vultures who are doing their job. They don't let the ladies into the game initially because they have fake tickets. Then, one of them tries to get past the security guard and gets stopped. Then, they're not let into the stadium again until they want to dance off with Billy Porter. Because yeah, that's a thing. Then, once they're in the stadium and they get caught on the Jumbotron, they're kicked out again for a brief moment. So we've established the premise that they should not be in there, and every corner of the stadium is looked at closely. 
And yet, somehow, without any scene where they elude security guards or devise a plan or anything like that, the four of them leave their skybox, somehow get to the opposite side of the field where the coach's box is, walk into the coach's box of the Patriots, and I kid you not, start calling the plays for the Patriots, with Lou delivering a speech through the headset to Tom Brady. That's right. The great defensive play by the Pats in the second half that sparked the comeback? It had nothing to do with the coaching staff or the players. It was entirely because four ladies got into the coach's box without any security noticing whatsoever and started calling plays and talking directly with Tom Brady. I swear on my life, I'm not making that up. There is no consistency with this movie. Everything just feels convenient to advance the plot. How are you going to establish the fact that there's tight security everywhere and then allow this to happen? It would be different if the ladies devised a plan to elude the guards or trick someone or something like that. But nope, they just walked right into the box. Just baffling. Now the movie does have a kind heart. It wants to convey the message that you only get one chance to live your life, so live it to the fullest. And it achieves that message to some extent. Is this movie the worst thing I've ever seen? Not even close. I've seen Cats. And I'll admit, I chuckled a few times in the first half, even if the comedy dried up completely over the final hour of the movie. But is this a bad movie? Oh, you bet. Much of it is filler that goes nowhere. It's tough to connect to some of the characters because of how sloppy their stories are. And common sense is tossed out the window as a way to drive the plot forward which I do not like one bit. It is so lazy. The 80 in 80 for Brady is really not about the age of the ladies, but rather how many minutes of the movie I wanted to be anywhere else. I'll give this a 2 out of 5, but trust me, unlike the Super Bowl, you can definitely afford to miss this. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.